Good afternoon. We'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we're uh, missing a couple of commissioners this afternoon. Uh, Chairman Walker won't be with us. He's on vacation, so uh, he is uh, getting a live feed from us this afternoon. So uh, he will be joining us uh, by way of uh, community telephone communication. Uh, today is July the 13th, 2020, and uh, we'll go ahead and call this monthly meeting to order. I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, to our monthly meeting uh, if you're visiting with us and we certainly always encourage anyone and everyone to join in with us uh, on our uh, monthly board meetings it's the best way to know what's going on in the community and uh, so we certainly do encourage that as always we start our meetings out with a prayer and a pledge and uh, uh, we're going to ask uh, uh, commissioner bond if she will to uh, lead us in the pledge and then uh, commissioner green will lead us in the prayer We'll stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening. Thank you for your many blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for life today. We thank you for your son that died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and give us eternal life. We pray that we come together this evening that you bless each one that's here. We pray that you'd help us to carry on the business of this county with the interest of all in mind. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay, we'll ask the board if they will to approve the minutes. Is there a motion? So we we'll make a motion we approve the minutes. Second. A motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, we need to approve the agenda for tonight. So uh, do I hear a motion and a second on the approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. Got a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So <clears throat> Going on down to our appointments tonight uh, uh, under item A, the first one will be the COVID-19 update, and uh, I understand Karen Powell couldn't be with us tonight, but we've got the distinguished William Keller here with us, so uh, we'll let uh, William, if you will, William, come up and, uh, and give us an update. Hey, good afternoon to you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, today marks day 120 of our EOC uh, activation for COVID-19. Um, we start this week with several uh, items of importance. We have 5,064 5 tested, 4,545 negative, 236 tests are pending, and we have 283 positives. We do expect an additional update later uh, this afternoon or early evening as staff uh, at the health department and at the EOC continues to work on new numbers that have come in uh, this afternoon. Several things that I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, current trends in our data. Uh, we have seen our positivity rate increase to 6%. Uh, that is an increase from where we were at the past several weeks. We are still uh, below our 8%, 8.5% uh, threshold uh, that we were at back at the beginning of June. It's something that we closely continue to monitor. And the positivity rate is uh, remind you is when we look at the total number of tests performed it does not include the pending tests they can't be included in that number the total number of positive and negatives um, and then the percentage of positives out of total number of tested we have 81 in quarantine 200 out of quarantine and we have uh, two deaths six percent hospitalization rate is the update this is as of uh, Friday afternoon we have not uh, got this number updated for this afternoon as we await additional uh, data to come from the health department. As I've said in the past, we continue to monitor the trends of our age break uh, age groups and the breakdown of positives in each of those groups. Our pediatric age group, zero to 17 years of age, has 24% of our positives. Uh, we're uh, greater than uh, two times the uh, state average in that age group. And as I've said in the past, it's certainly something that we continue to monitor because we do not want to see 
that percentage move into our elderly population uh, where we currently stand at 10 percent which is just slightly under the state average the majority of our cases are in the age group of 25 to 49 years of age and uh, the 28752 zip code marion having the most uh, positive cases when we look at it as a breakdown I do uh, I will announce this afternoon and the press release is forthcoming from the health department that we have two congregate living outbreaks an outbreak in congregate living is defined as two or more cases um, a cluster is defined as five or more cases uh, this is something that our team has worked on extremely hard from the very beginning of this incident is to prevent the virus from entering uh, these congregate living areas but as of today we are reporting we have two uh, facilities that are experiencing an outbreak uh, in the planning stages the past 16 weeks the EOC team and public health along with the facility administrators have been very uh, deliberate in planning for this type of incident occurring we have developed a uh, long-term care strike team this looks at operationally what actions need to be taken once you understand the, or once we know the virus has entered a facility what are the actions that can immediately be taken to further protect uh, this, the residents and the staff that are inside that facility uh, in doing that planning we have partnered with dogwood health trust there's a geriatrician a physician who specializes uh, and has experience working in another county uh, she told us this afternoon she's currently worked three outbreaks uh, but she has been providing guidance along the way on best practices what needs to happen once the incident occurs uh, so now we are in uh, where we are in planning and preparation we are in response mode uh, for the outbreaks in congregate living so what will this include uh, daily contact with the facilities to ensure their proper personal protection equipment uh, consultation and uh, technical support being offered by the health department as well as the emergency operations center our logistics officer has already uh, provided ppe push packs uh, to the congregate facility that has uh, the long-term care facility um, where we have multiple uh, patients and staff uh, that work in the facility I should note that the facility none of the patients at this time have tested positive it is uh, staff members uh, that we have that are positive the PPE push packs not only have been sent locally but it's uh, push packs that have been sent by uh, North Carolina emergency management as well as FEMA in advance of us knowing of the incident uh, occurring in the facility our team is totally uh, committed to provide around the clock support to these long-term care facilities this uh, has the potential to be a serious situation as I've said we need big folks wearing masks when we're wearing masks we are protecting these employees from long-term care we may not work in long-term care facilities but when we pass them in the public um, it's something that uh, we feel is important and we are protecting them um, from contracting this virus and, and we are um, asking folks please wear a mask when we look at long-term care we know that outbreaks in these facilities can increase hospitalization rates it can increase our mortality rate and essentially it is all hands on deck for our team and public health to protect our most our most vulnerable citizens that are um, residing in the facility testing sites results and turnaround times after the july 4th holiday we have seen an extended amount of time or it's taken an extended amount of time to turn the results around due to the large number of tests that are coming in to the various labs and we are experiencing that locally seeing uh, test results uh, extended to five to seven days and we know that those test results need to be out much quicker um, but our team is doing everything in conjunction with public health to monitor for results and turn those around as quick as possible we continue to do drive-through testing sites um, we have the next site coming up on Wednesday at Grace Community Church 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Or, or 12 noon that's on 70 West and then on Friday 
9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the health department, um, and that is also a drive-through site. I'm extremely proud of the long hours that not only public health is working, but emergency services team at the EOC is working. Um, literally upon knowing uh, of a potential issue, we had folks working literally around the clock last night. They were out early this morning. We have completed testing of all residents in that facility, and we are working actively as we speak to finish uh, staff. So I again, uh, this is a, a situation that we take very serious, uh, and it's all hands on deck for our agency. Appreciate that, uh, Elliot. Uh, you know, it sometimes it, it seems like that uh, a lot of people uh, at times will think that uh, this has all been pushed into a political thing where uh, that you're required to wear a mask. I, I think we should, uh, you know, look in our hearts and say, listen, I want to wear a mask to protect that other person, if not for me, for someone else. There are people that are are uh, in our communities, uh, in our churches, and and uh, at Walmart, wherever, that uh, are really high risk, you know, and you're going to be, I don't care who you are, you're going to be around some of those people, eventually. So, you know, I think, I just think it uh, is important to us to, to have the consideration to, to wear the mask for their safety, if not for our own. So, uh, I, I would certainly encourage that. I'd also like to say that I appreciate the good work that uh, your department's doing and all the emergency services uh, that are involved. Uh, you guys do a great job and we really appreciate it. Also, I'd like for you to relay the thanks that we have to uh, our health department, Karen Powell and the third group. Uh, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot that is put together that makes up this uh, uh, defense that we're forming uh, against this COVID problem that we have and, uh, and I just appreciate everything that uh, I know that our whole board does. We appreciate everything that all you guys are doing to try to help protect us. Anybody else got any comments? Well, if you uh, stated that uh, we're at six percent, that's correct, been hospitalized. That's correct. Uh, zero to seventeen age group, twenty-four percent is that number. That's correct. Can you tell me from zero to 17 how many of those have been hospitalized? I don't have that number with me right can now. Can you get them? Yes, we can. Okay. Chairman Walker, do you hear us? I hear you. Uh, do you have any questions for Mr. Kelly? One statement, I was at Walmart over here at Texas Ford, checking my car the spot, and probably 99% of the people uh, stopped where it said, and they uh, were going to get on the back. Wow. No, I, I thought the wing today, I thought I was going to be concerned in this, it, it, it's not him, it's not, and I agree, you have to wear a mask, and, and I don't, and I know I came out of the health care setting, and I know it kind of looks bad, uh, but I've been, and half the people wear them, half don't, half wear them correctly, half don't, and I think that it, it is important. I do feel that, you know, and I'm, I'm ripped right down through the middle from the health care side and from a, and the economic side, and I know I should always err on the health and safety of the people. This county is what I did for 26 years. It's always their best interest. Um, but, you know, when you go to Walmart, there's 500 people in there, and um, and, and I talked to you today, you know, I told us you can correct me anytime you want to, and that's fine. I, I accept that. I said, but, you know, when we close our courthouse down because of a positive, but we go to Walmart, how do you know there's not positives in there and it runs wide open and you shut on and pops down? It's hard for me to stomach. It's hard for me to, uh, as a county commissioner, and as a citizen, as, as a person that goes in, you know, as it was this morning, and the majority of them was not in a mask. And that, that kind of surprised me in a way. But, how do we, you know, how do we monitor that? Um, I was at a restaurant yesterday and people walked up to the door and read the message on the door and turned around and walked off. You know, that's a small business and I thought, well, they could go through the drive-through we were eating in. And, uh, 
it, it's hard it, it's hard when you're facing the public and they can't get the right information or we can we can say it's not politicized and, and I've, I've thought about that too um, but when you go there can walk into a riot not a protest but a riot take his mask off and say the man that we wear one that's two-faced plain and simple and uh, it, it's hard it's hard to explain to the public when they can't get truthful answers out of our state government I, i'm not blaming local i think we're doing what's right but the if it continues the way it is it's going to be pretty chaotic right these people are going to fight and and i think that's the thing is it's I don't know how you get your minds changed with you on that. Like with me, I, I wear mine when I go to the barber because we have close proximity. And I try to stay away from people, stay at home most of the time, or just stay off to myself. And um, it is very hard. But 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 I please know, please know that I support you know the, the efforts to try and, and curb this thing. And I know you said well, we need to wear a mask. And I think as individuals think that we're going to have to search our hearts, like Tony said, and, and think about it. But, I'm you know, ready to get back to the commissioner's boardroom. I know it's nice down here, but sooner or later we got to get back to function because they're uptight with school. My kids are uptight. Uh, everybody I talk to, they don't like the, the process of what's going on, um, and it's not a good educational experience. And I know you say, "Well, we get them all together, an outbreak." Dang if you do, and dang if you don't. So uh, that's all my process. Oh, I went to Walmart. I think it was Monday. No, this is Monday, so I guess it was Friday. And I was pleasantly pleased that a bunch more people had on their masks than normal <coughs> than, than usual. But I think some of the confusion when I was talking, and I wear my mask out here, I do. Uh, but some people were talking. Well, I read that, and and the governor says if you know if if you don't feel like you can breathe or if you don't miss and you don't have to and I think that was confusing there was some confusion in the way that was presented as far as where it but now you don't have to you know and so when I guess when mother used to give me uh, an inch I'd always take a mile so I think as citizens we take a mile if we're given an inch for anything but I appreciate everything y'all are doing because you're at the front line you are out there testing. I appreciate every hour and every minute y'all are working with this. I appreciate communications and You're everything all the way down because it runs the gamut. It's not just one little group, it's the whole pocket full. So we appreciate you. There's so much conflicting information. That's it. There is so many different opinions. I wear this mask as a community leader. I wear this mask to protect the elderly in this community. I wear it to protect the sick child recovering at home from a devastating disease or whatever it may be of all the people that I've passed. And as I've said plenty of times of the disasters that I come back with, when politics and disasters collide, bad things can happen. And as a local community leader in the healthcare community, I hope people can look at this individually and think about the other people, our most vulnerable in this community. We have over 700 elderly people in our adult care homes and long-term care facilities that we have got to protect. This isn't about me, my personal opinions. This is about us and our team trying to protect our most vulnerable citizens here in this community. Oh, my exactly. We only appreciate that. You know, Again, I want to reiterate uh, my feelings on this. You know, uh, no matter what we think, let's let's just try to be respectful for other people. Right. Not, you know, let's take ourselves out of the equation and let's just be respectful for other people. Uh, one other thing that uh, I did see on the news that uh, uh, you might share something on that, uh, but uh, according to what the news said, that North Carolina right now is in the top six in the nation for the increase in the COVID virus. I can't uh, comment specifically because I haven't looked at that today. I, I do know that the trend in North Carolina is concerning on the positivity rate. And as I've said a number of times, 
it's so important not to look at the daily number of positives that it increases. It's all about the percentage of the trends. Yes, more testing will drive more positive cases, but when you see the positivity rate increase, uh, that's that's the trend that we're concerned about. And we've seen an uptake or uptick in McDowell uh, as well as across North Carolina. Okay, thank you, Mr. Keller, for that. Uh, we're uh, we're going to hear uh, item B was the 911 center update, and I uh, thank you and uh, Ms. Uh, Emily Buck. We're going to do that one. So if you guys will just come on up, and we'll proceed into that. Yeah, so uh, thanks again. Uh, I'm going to recognize Amberly and let her explain the project. Yes, excuse me, David, you come. David. I'm busy. I'm busy. Uh, go ahead, excuse me. For over two years now, uh, the 911 Center and the staff led by Amberly Buff, our 911 manager, has been working on the Next Generation project. I've provided several updates. Uh, over the course of time on uh, this project. It, it's exciting, it's new technology for the center. But uh, before she gives an overview of the work that's been done and the project completion uh, update, I want to take a minute and recognize the work that she does, not only for this project, uh, but she truly leads our 911 center. I'm extremely grateful to have a solid leadership team and uh, Amberly sits at the core of that. And, uh, just absolutely works her heart out day in and day out. So I appreciate what she does and you know, let her give an update of uh, the exciting work in, in the 911 Center. Thank you, William. As he said, we went to the statewide EasyNet program and to give you an idea what that is, the state has invented an IP cloud-based phone system and they have ensured us that it is so redundant that we will not lose connectivity. We opted to go hosted, which means that they monitor our equipment 24 hours, seven days a week. This helped on financial side as well for us to go to the hosted system because all of our main equipment is in Raleigh. So they monitor our, all of our equipment 24 hours, seven days a week. If anything happens to our system, if our building was to catch on fire and we all logged out of our system, our phone calls would immediately go to Rutherford County. Um, along with that, if something crashed in our system and the system was seeing a problem with McDowell County's network itself, again, our phone calls would immediately go to Rutherford County. This is a statewide system, so we could pick up our phone calls in Murphy or Manio just like we can in Marion, North Carolina, as soon as everybody is on the same hosting. They are not all completely done yet, so that's not the case right now. But once we are all on the system, if something was to happen here, we could go to any county that's hosted or on the EZNet system and answer our phone calls as we are sitting in our center. As we all know, that is not the same as sitting in our center, but if we had to, that would be an option. Like he said, we started this approximately two years ago. It was a long, hard process. It consisted of weekly conference calls with the state, AT&T, Entrado, and Motorola. I can't say anything bad about our team. We had some hiccups and some bumps in the road. Our system did include an update to our TTY and tech system. I opted out of texting because the system they were gonna provide would not allow me to initiate the text out. We right now in McDowell County text a lot of phone calls out every day to 911 hangups. When the state came in and said, this is your option for your text, they did not give me the option to text out, so I told them we would not go on their system because I was not gonna take something away from our citizens that we already provided to them. We do get some 911 texts into the center, but our percentage of outgoing texts is extremely higher than our inbound texting. Because we can simply, if Brenda calls 911, if we call her back, lots of times they will not answer. But if we text Brenda, because a lot of high school students do call 911 on accident, we can text them. They will text us back and tell us that they do not have a problem. They'll tell us where we're at and we'll update the deputy of what's going on. This system also um, was an update to our equipment. So not only did we go onto the EziNet last Wednesday, we were able to update all our phone equipment. 
We stayed on the same program, which was great for our employees because it wasn't a whole lot of change for them, but we did have some upgrades in our system. And along with the ESINET, our location accuracy is better. Our GIS had a lot of work to do with this. They had to be a 99% in order for us to go to an I3 ESINET model. Most of the counties only went to ESINET. Uh, step one, step two was an I3. We were the first county to go to VESTA, ESINET, and I3 all at the same time in the western region. Also, if you're calling from the courthouse and you're on the second floor, we can now see that you're calling from the second floor when before we should only be able to see the area of where you're calling. Now, once our AZNet project is complete and the GIS project is complete, we should be able to see hopefully what room you are in in that building. So everything we do is a step in progress of getting better locations of where that 911 hangup call comes from in case that 911 hangup call is an actual emergency. And I can't say enough about going live on Wednesday. There was very little problems. Our team worked very well. We had the backup center staff and our primary center, and everybody had good attitudes. There was a lot of test calls. There was a lot of old system, new system, phone calls, redundancy. Our old system would ring, and the new system would ring behind it. So our staff put up with a lot that day, but we were very happy when the project was over and they said it was one of the quickest projects they did and we're very pleased with our staff. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, my wife absolutely she she will always love the 911 center we have here in the county and, and obviously it was because of the situation we, we had back in January when I was laying in the floor dead and uh, she, uh, she fortunately was on the phone with a, a, a representative of the 911 center, and uh, which you know helped her and guided her through all the steps that she needed to take. And you know, and, and I'm convinced that it, it made a difference. You know, and, and so it, you know, we really uh, should all, if you've never had to use the 911 call center, uh, uh, great. But if you ever do, it's, it's just a wonderful thing to have, and we appreciate uh, all the hard work that you've done and your staff have done. Thank you. And, uh, so thank you very much. Anybody else got coming? Kevin Walker, do you have anything to say? I would just say, Kevin, tell me what you said is up there. Uh, we have a very professional, dedicated, well trained group of individuals, and uh, just thank you uh, every day for what you did to, to protect them. Thank you. You said our phone calls would roll to all of them. Mm -hmm. Theirs goes down, theirs rolls down. They actually go to Catawba County. Oh, okay. I believe so Caldwell it's County. I think they go to Caldwell County. Okay. Each county chooses where they roll to. Roll to? Okay. Mitchell counties will roll to us. Oh, okay. We have to do that with summer, summer. I, I just want to thank her again and let the board know that not only has she implemented the project, made, made it successful, but her and her team done this during COVID, which we've had an EOC activation for 120 days now, but we've also got all of our normal divisions that are running. Um, how many calls a year are you processing? 120,000. 120,000 calls a year. EMS is running 10,000 calls. Community paramedics are 2,000 calls a year. So her uh, and her staff to get this accomplished in the midst of everything we have going on uh, is, is extremely uh, impressive, but also I'm extremely grateful for what they do, so. Thank you, Ben. Okay. We'll move along. Uh, uh, I, I'm three uh, under A is our uh, old business uh, EMS capital project update and uh, we'll turn to the town manager Mr. Wooden uh, to give us an update on that. Yes sir, uh, thank you. Um, quick update on this project. Uh, when we were putting the agenda together we didn't know if it would be a good update or a bad update. So it's a good update of course you all know that on the board side. Uh, last Tuesday, we um, participated in a uh, phone call with the local government commission uh, for their board meeting where we submitted the uh, application approval uh, to them for um, our EMS projects. 
this was the last uh, official uh, phase before we could sign construction contracts with the contractors. Uh, they, uh, being the commission, which is comprised of the uh, treasurer, state auditor, uh, secretary of revenue, and a few other folks, uh, and go over every project. Um, they, you know, learn of the the costs, what you're going to do, uh, if there's any concerns about uh, paying for the project, those sorts of things. That's all discussed there. Uh, it was approved. There were no uh, comments or concerns by the commission about uh, the project. They had seen um, the what the commissioners have committed to do as far as county finances, and very pleased with uh, our financial position uh, and where we're headed with that. So uh, today, this morning, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Brown signed several documents for the, the loan. Uh, I signed the construction contracts and uh, we're about two weeks from being underway on station four, which is the north station. Don't have a date on the larger one. I imagine that'll take a little more time as far as the scale, uh, but uh, by sometime in early August, both projects should be underway. So we're very excited and those staff is to see that um, coming along and at that point the board I'm sure you are. Okay, thank you, Mr. Whitten. Uh, no action required at this time, so uh, yes, sir. we will move along uh, to the old business plan B board appointments. And uh, we've got the uh, Dow Tech Board of Trustees. And uh, I think everyone has had an opportunity to cast their vote on that. Matt Clark, if you would receive these. And, uh, Okay, also in the old business, uh, I'll see the uh, update on the public shooting range. Uh, we'll turn it over to Mr. Wooden again and let him get a full update on that. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, another, uh, we talked about this last month. We were a little, um, I think, two weeks out from the, the bid opening, which was held on July 1st in this room. Uh, don't have the list right in front of me, but we had um, 12, approximately 12 bids from companies all over Western North Carolina, which is a tremendous uh, response. A lot of that probably has to do with the state of the economy, with the pandemic and other things. Uh, the, the low bidder um, for the project is England Builders. And so um, we always love, it's not always the opportunity or the, uh, the chance, but uh, when a local contractor can be the low bidder, it's always uh, it's always great because you know their quality, uh, pick up the phone and call the owner. Um, and so it doesn't always work out that way, but it, it did in this case. So um, there were a couple of alternates and you have the um, total price in front of you, uh, $2,216,590. Again, that is in line with estimates uh, that we've provided you. Uh, also note that the classroom slash office building uh, was not in this bid, but uh, we bid separately, and that was on purpose. Um, so we, uh, uh, NC Wildlife handled uh, the bidding process. Uh, they have prepared the attached uh, bid tabulation form uh, on page 37 that has all the contractors listed. Uh, and so you see again England uh, being the most responsive low bidder there. So um, staff, the county staff and NC Wildlife staff do recommend uh, that you award the contract to England Builders. So if you choose to do so, uh, the action would be to enter the bids into the minutes and uh, award the contract to England Builders. Good, thank you, sir. This 
was a vision that uh, I personally had uh, some over five years ago uh, when I come on the board and you know as soon as I mentioned it to the board members uh, you know every all board members were all over it and in favor of it and uh, and I say, I'd like to say that our board, in, in, including every member, has worked very hard over the past five years to try to make this happen. And uh, so now we're seeing it happen. And uh, I just want to say that uh, I thank all the board members for all the hard work that they have put into it, and uh, the staff, uh, uh, Mr. Wooten uh, and uh, Ron Harmon, and uh, all that have been involved in this. And so we're finally seeing it come to be a real thing and uh, I'm just really excited about it and uh, uh, so uh, anybody else have any comments on the shooting range? Mr. Chairman I'd move that we uh, enter the bids into the minutes and award the contract to England Builders and get this thing underway. We've got a motion. We'll give a second. Second. A second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chairman Walker do you have anything to say to that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Tony, I'm very excited. This is our board members on uh, on this project. Finally, uh, getting ready to have a groundbreaking, and we look forward to uh, recreational shooting occurring in Bell County on a supervised range. And uh, this has been a goal. The board gets up to that, get a vision. The board's up to it and agree. And uh, thanks for our partners, for service, and uh, others who worked hard on this in the past. And we look forward to that. This, this is another added feature of our recreation program. Uh, there's trails, it's called recreation shooting, uh, youth sports. This is another piece of the puzzle and another opportunity for people to get involved in the downtown. So, uh, great job. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, okay, so we had a motion in a second, and uh, we, we, we can vote on it. Okay. Okay, well then we're moving forward with that. All right, uh, under new business, uh, item A, uh, uh, administrative items, uh, Mr. Wooten, uh, would you like to lead us off with that? Yes, sir, I'd be glad to. Um, <clears throat> the administrative items, or um, I like to call them housekeeping items as well, uh, that don't necessarily fit under uh, or have enough to have their own standalone item, so just for information. Uh, the first item you have in your packet um, is a request from the town of Old Fort uh, for a waiver of the fireworks permit fee of $80. Um, the, the county provides funding, uh, I believe this year was in the amount of $1,000, to go towards the fireworks themselves. Uh, but without your action, uh, staff would typically charge a permit fee uh, for uh, the town in this instance. So uh, you've got their letter there on page 39 requesting the waiver. Motion to approve the uh, waiver request. Uh, I'd like to, before we vote on that, I'd like to uh, also uh, say that it would be uh, my thought and intention that this be done away with permanently. So I'd like to hear the pleasure board on that. So, you know, we're, uh, this is what eighty some dollars. Yeah, it, right. It's it's, it's dirty nothing. But uh, yeah, this is something that the whole county enjoys. You know, uh, and, and uh, you know the fireworks is something that everybody can go to and enjoy. And you know, I, I think that they would just uh, the uh, board commissioners to to waive that and definitely uh, that that fee. You know, that's just. If the Moose Lodge approaches us and wants to do a fireworks, I know they used to do that, and you know, the old Yogi kept that, but do they have to pay a fee on that? They do. They did pay this year. But, uh, you know, the, whenever you're looking, and, and I'm, I'm just uh, looking at the cities in, in McDowell County, I'm not talking about private entities. Uh, I'm talking about municipalities. And the town would be the only instance where this would apply. The city, the city does their own inspections in that regard. Yeah. So we do, uh, to the question as far as fee waivers and things, we do have uh, some exemptions for uh, funded agencies, including school systems, 
uh, sometimes uh, municipalities are included in there as well uh, as far as straight out exemptions and so this could easily be put in the fee schedule as just a, a permanent waiver unless changed by a future board if you'd like to do that well that's my heart on the heart Chairman Walker, would you like to say anything to that? Uh, I'll just uh, say that uh, I actually went to the old Fort Fireworks this year. Very good job. Uh, the board went ahead and it's just there and it did not do theirs. We said that money, the board wanted to do that to make the old Fort Fireworks even better this year. And uh, so for one government to the other, I've got their job waiting for maybe the auction. Just a few more admin items. Um, the next item I'll actually um, go over really quickly. Uh, we have a few positions that uh, we're just trying to keep our uh, position listing cleaned up. Um, so that starts on page 40. Uh, Mr. Suttles has asked that we uh, just take out uh, being J. Suttles and inspections, a couple of positions that are uh, titles that antiquated. So taking out building inspector apprentice, uh, fire inspector two, um, and uh, reclassifying those under a different title. So. It's okay with the board would like to do that. What's the position of the board on that? Move we approve. Second. The motion is second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, just a couple more. And uh, the next item, talk about intergovernmental relations a moment ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. Speaking of water, I might need some. Uh, at your June 30 meeting, uh, I believe, uh, the, the board voted to increase water rates for the Nevo water system 3%. Uh, that was based on uh, communication uh, with the city from uh, a time before some information changed uh, there at the city. And so they actually uh, increased their water rates 5% and not 3 And so we would like to do the same in order to keep uh, everything equal for um, since we pass on any uh, increases to our customers typically. Otherwise, we would be creating a deficit. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, approve that increase. Second. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay, next. Thank you. And the last item is the EMS write offs that we would ask you to approve. Motion board on the EMS write offs. Motion approved write offs. Second. Motion. Here, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Moving on to item B, tax matters. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a, a few releases. Uh, there are uh, some common area that was identified, and again, that is uh, not to be taxed. Um, there are also some discoveries uh, in our business listing and a few automobile uh, listings there on page 51. 52. That's all. Okay, what's the pleasure, board? Motion we approve the tax matters. The motion is set. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Okay. The uh, PDC housing grant, uh, Mr. Wood, would you give us an update on that? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, I, uh, IPDC stands for Isothermal Planning and Development Commission. Uh, Commissioner Vaughn. Uh, as well as myself, sit on that uh, board. Uh, IPDC uh, is a four county region, uh, regional government that we're a member of, and they provide different services for this county as well as the other three. One of the areas they've traditionally worked in is housing, and so for many, many years, uh, they have assisted with housing rehabilitation grants. Sometimes the county has been the recipient of the grant, um, and Isothermal has administered those. Some of the folks have been around a while might remember Paula Kempton, different staff. Uh, in this instance, IPDC was the applicant for the grant, and so um, they have applied for and received this grant uh, and are 
asking for an administrative fee to help with the actual implementation because most of the, if not all the grant uh, funds are going towards actual rehabilitation costs. So the grant will uh, rehabilitate uh, up to five homes. And these homes are typically uh, in fair condition. Uh, they're not poor condition. Uh, they might need a new roof. They might need a new heating system, uh, maybe some flooring repairs, maybe some siding if they can get it in. But they typically, uh, this agency, NC Housing Finance, looks for homes that are right on the edge of going down or they can't be repaired at all. Uh, we've repaired some in the past that probably needed to be replaced, and this isn't what this group does. So it's a great way to use outside resources to uh, repair some of the housing stock of low to moderate income folks. So you've got a breakdown request of uh, over the next three years in this contract of $20,000 that will be paid for the administrative costs, uh, $7,500 for the next two fiscal years, including the current one, and then $5,000 in the last year. So that would space that out over the term of the project. Did Kurt Petty may have any comments? Not for the pleasure of the board. My pleasure. Second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Item D, uh, property sale update. Mr. Wood. Uh, yes, sir. A very brief update on this item. I mentioned, again, I believe on the 30th, uh, the <coughs> staff had uh, received a, an offer for uh, about 65 acres of county owned property on Forest Lake Heights. Uh, that the board had declared surplus several years ago. Uh, at the 30th meeting, you approved a resolution authorizing the uh, sale of that property. And just again, a brief update, we're still in the process of closing and have not closed yet. So uh, anticipate uh, that happening hopefully by the end of the week. And uh, we'll give an update next Monday. So that's all I have on that item. Thank you. Do you request action on that? Not no, tonight. Not tonight. Okay. Okay. Out of me, uh, the voting delegate for uh, NACO and NCAA, ACC. Uh, um, do we have any volunteers for that? Or I think Mr. Wooten uh, would be uh, pleased to take care of that for us. <laughs> Is, please find me a strong, uh, good strong word, but I'd be glad to if um, there's not interest. The uh, acronyms, uh, National Association of Counties and the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, these are advocacy groups for counties at the, the national and state level. Uh, we definitely always ask for desig uh, designees every year for the Association of County Commissioners Conference because that's usually the driving distance. The National Conference is usually in a far flung location. This year it's online and free and more importantly so we're trying to get as many counties to participate. I'd be glad to. Yeah, I think you went last year. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Ashley said that, you know, since it's online, I uh, think would be willing to take care of that for us if it please. Board, what's the pleasure? Mr. Chairman, I would move that we uh, designate Ashley Wooden, our county manager, as the uh, voting delegate this year. Second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you, Mr. Wooden. Uh, we'll go to citizen comments next, and uh, we have uh, anyone here tonight that has signed up for citizen comment? If so, uh, I think Madam Clerk is bringing that forward. We'll go to uh, Commissioner Staff reports communication. Mr. Wood. Okay. Just one item, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, a note for the board and the public. Uh, the animal shelter um, that is under uh, public services, uh, we will need to close the shelter from uh, Thursday, July 30th through Monday, August 10th. There are some uh, necessary repairs we need to make to the, uh, the floor coating and the wall coating there. Uh, it's a little more involved in getting out of paint roller, as you can imagine, in the high moisture uh, environment. So uh, we will need that much time to 
uh, do that repair and improvement. So we will be putting that out on social media, through the newspaper, et cetera, to remind people. Um, <coughs> And to be clear, the animals that are there, um, we will find homes for uh, fostering or otherwise. Um, and so they will be taken care of. So we do want to make sure the public is aware of that. Um, we'll make alternative arrangements during that time for bite dogs, etc. Would the commissioners have to make that? What would you? We are adjourned.